Hi, everybody, and welcome to St. John's Grimsby Home Edition. I'm Reverend Kyle Dorr. Thanks so much for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about something you likely don't remember, but it's something that happened to you. Then, no, I'm not talking about the time you took your first steps and walked. I'm not talking about the first word that you ever said. I'm talking about your baptism. Chances are, if you are in the Reformed tradition uh, or a Presbyterian, uh, you likely don't remember the day that you were baptized simply because you were likely an infant. If you don't remember the day you were baptized, click the like button. I personally don't remember the day that I was baptized. I was uh, less than a year old, so uh, I, I don't remember uh, that day. Uh, and I don't realize that some of you may remember that day because uh, maybe you grew up in a tradition uh, where uh, you took a believer's baptism, meaning that you were able to come to the place where you chose for yourself to be baptized. And that's great. And if you do remember uh, your baptism, then I also want you to click the like button because it's, it's great. And if you're a person that's never been baptized and you're really interested in that, uh, first of all, uh, stick around to the through this service because it'll teach you a little bit more about baptism. Uh, and if it's something that you would like to do for yourself, then please contact me and uh, I'd love to discuss that further with you. It's uh, a wonderful day to worship God and I'm so thankful that we can do this together. If you're new to uh, our church, I invite you to take a look at the video description on this video. It tells you a little bit about uh, who we are, what we are all about, what we're up to, and most importantly, how you can connect with us. We would love to hear from you, so use the contact info in the video description to get a hold of us, or you can uh, say hello in the chat or leave a comment, and uh, we will do our best uh, to connect with you. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, so, uh, as we continue our look at the Great Commission, uh, we're going to talk about baptism. What does baptism mean? Why is baptism a part of the Great Commission? And what does that actually look like in uh, the ministry that we share in together? So, uh, before we get into that uh, topic, uh, I invite us just to uh, take a gentle breath to calm our body and mind and spirit as we have a moment of silence, and then Reverend Maria will lead us in our opening prayer. Let us now talk to our Heavenly Father. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, God of all that is good, we praise you for your mighty and humble acts. Hear us as we offer our pray and adoration for your glorious ways, for your very being in our lives. Thank you for sending your Son to come to earth to show us the way, to live the life we could not, for the example we could not achieve, and to be the sacrifice for our sins. We praise for the other Counselor, the Holy Spirit, that you sent into our midst to fulfill your promise. May your powerful Spirit melt us, mold us, form us, and you, Heavenly Father, use us to advance your kingdom. May we always be open to your love, united with your eternal oneness, Embrace every opportunity you provide, simply trusting you every day. We are also thankful that you forgive us over and over again. So here we are, beaten with so many things in life, choosing wrong direction, talking too soon, or not talking at all. You know, all our shortcomings. We regret them and bringing them to you and thank you for setting us free by forgiving our sins through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Our first reading today is taken from Matthew, chapter 28, verses 19 to 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Our second reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Nicodemus visits Jesus. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, but no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, 
Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You might notice that today's scripture reading contains one of the most famous verses, most remembered verses in all of scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life or have everlasting life. Uh, and also uh, the, the next verse right beside it, verse 17 is, is uh, so essential uh, as well that, uh, that the Son of uh, God did not uh, come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Uh, this passage uh, and those verses in particular, I read one, uh, one commentator this week said that those verses really shine a very bright light. There's almost like a beacon for the entirety of the book of John. Uh, and so we're first going to talk a little bit about what baptism is and, and you know, what's happening here in this passage. Well, uh, it, it begins, John chapter 3, uh, begins with a man named Nicodemus. Uh, he, uh, he comes to visit Jesus. Uh, Nick, I'll call him. He, he's a, uh, a scholar. He is uh, a Pharisee, someone that's very well acquainted uh, with what the Torah law says. And so he comes to have a conversation with Jesus. It's really important to note that uh, Nicodemus, or Nick, uh, comes at night to see Jesus. Uh, and uh, you might kind of read that thing. That's a sort of a small detail. What's, what's the deal with that? But all throughout the Gospel of John, there are these contrasting terms uh, that John uses uh, quite intentionally uh, to, to tell the story of Jesus. He uses uh, contrasting words like uh, light and dark, uh, like uh, night and day. Uh, and uh, as we'll uh, talk a little in a little bit, uh, words like above and below. But Nicodemus comes at night. He comes in secret. He comes so that nobody will see that he's there to meet Jesus, uh, because it could be uh, a bit controversial in his circle that uh, these people that persecute Jesus by day, that one of them uh, would come and visit him by night uh, to, to learn a bit more. Uh, and so as the the conversation unfolds. Uh, Nicodemus uh, tells Jesus what he is observing. He gives Jesus the facts and says, hey, well, we see the signs that you're doing, so you must be from God. Uh, he doesn't uh, uh, 
really mince words or on that. He just says, "Hey, this is what this is what I'm noticing, uh, and so this is uh, this is the conclusion that I'm going to." Uh, and as Jesus explains to uh, to Nicodemus uh, that. Um, in order for a person to really be able to see God or the kingdom of God, that person needs to be born again. Uh, and again, this is sort of where that term born again Christian comes from, uh, this this very chapter. So again, we see this got a, a huge key verse essential um, in, in the Christian faith, but also this this term, this born again. Uh, and, and Nicodemus takes Jesus quite literally at his words. I think, well, I can't uh, be you know, be born again from my mother in the physical sense. And Jesus says, no, uh, this is a, a birth in spirit, a rebirth in spirit, in water and spirit. Uh, we're going to pause here uh, because the the English uh, translation um, sort of uh, misses a little bit of the nuance from the Greek because uh, the, um, the, the word that Jesus used, uh, according to John, um, it can be translated uh, into English as the word again, uh, and so and, and that's that's one one way of interpreting that, and that's how Nicodemus seemed to do that from very much the literal sense. Uh, but that Greek word can also be translated in the word uh, the English word above, and so this this Greek word can mean either again or it can mean above. And so if we think about it from uh, the, these contrasting terms uh, that John uses in his gospel, uh, it really brings a, a little uh, deeper meaning to that sense. And Jesus saying, if somebody is going to be born into the kingdom of heaven, uh, they need to be born from above, not born from below. And in order to be born from above, they need to, uh, to have a, a spiritual birth, um, and uh, a birth symbolized by water. Uh, and so again, this is uh, alluding to baptism. Uh, and uh, so Jesus is, uh, is quite clear in saying uh, that baptism is an essential part, um, an essential practice and ritual uh, of, of believers in him that want to uh, publicly demonstrate that that they are full participants uh, in the, the life and the work of the kingdom of God. Uh, and when, uh, when one is, is willing to make that kind of a public statement to be baptized, um, that uh, affirms that, uh, first of all, uh, they believe in God, uh, they believe in Christ, and that's also uh, a sign that they believe in the power of the Spirit and that they want to commit themselves to um, living a healthy and active spiritual life because the kingdom of God, uh, it really is a spiritual experience. And these spiritual experiences uh, are reflected uh, in, in physical signs. Uh, so certainly a spiritual rebirth uh, is symbolized uh, in baptism, um, but also the, the, the spiritual work of, of people working together in Jesus' name, uh, those are physically expressed in the various forms of church that there are. Uh, and I'm not talking about church buildings, but I'm talking about the church as a people, as a body, uh, as a group of disciples. Remember last week in the Great Commission, uh, we looked at uh, the importance of going to all nations and make disciples of the believers, uh, and so we're taking this the next step further. Uh, if one is uh, is a willing disciple, then they're going to be baptized uh, into that faith in a very public uh, expression of that. Um, and so, uh, so you know, kind of what's the deal with baptism, and how does this actually work for a group of uh, people, Reformed Christians, uh, who really practice infant baptism because you can't. Um, make a decision for yourself as a baby that you're going to follow Jesus because uh, you, you kind of know who your mom and dad are. You might maybe know who your siblings are. You might recognize uh, your grandparents or people you see all the time, but you really don't really have a concept of who Jesus is. So how does that work? We don't believe that one's place in heaven is simply uh, sewn up by, by doing the proper ritual uh, here on earth, but those are outward signs of inward transformation. Uh, and so uh, it's important that 
uh, if you're baptizing an infant, that uh, as as parents and caregivers, that uh, you are committing uh, to to teaching uh, this child uh, the ways of Jesus in in your home life, in your community life, uh, and certainly as part of. Uh, a fellowship in a congregation. And so uh, that's kind of where, where we come from with infant baptism is that it's, uh, it's parents making that decision or grandparents making that decision to support their children or grandchildren uh, in uh, their, uh, their raising them in faith, in the Christian faith. And so um, as we continue to, to practice uh, infant baptism. Um, and certainly if anyone is one who practices believer's baptism, that's great too. Um, <laughs> however, however one wants to approach it, uh, I think in light of the Great Commission, uh, it's important, ba baptism is important. So whether it happens in infancy, whether it happens uh, as a youth or as an adult, um, it, it's important to to be able to publicly make that decision. And different groups have different ways of uh, using some verbiage around that baptism. Uh, and so taking a, a look at uh, the vows that we have as uh, Presbyterians, and, and at least kind of following the, the question the PCC lines out uh, for folks, uh, there's some questions to the parents that are bringing their child or the grandparents bringing their grandchild to be baptized. Um, and, and the first is renouncing sin. Uh, the second question is about if they turn to Jesus and acknowledge him as Lord. Um, and the third is that they they wish to, in dependence on the Holy Spirit, uh, to to nurture their child or their grandchild in faith, um, and that uh, uh, that they would uh, really teach them to have a meaningful relationship uh, with Jesus Christ, to be able to accept Him as Lord and Savior, uh, with God the Creator, and to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, and they're going to do so, they promise to do so, within the fellowship of that congregation in which they're being baptized. Uh, and so, you know, there's that side of it, but it's also uh, the other side of it, looking at it from the congregation's perspective. Uh, each, each one that's present um, promises to nurture and encourage the child being baptized, but also to give that community support to the parents uh, as they uh, raise their child in the Christian faith. It's not something that you do alone. Uh, when I took a, a quick look at uh, some other kind of believers' baptism vows from, from different uh, Christian traditions, uh, from some Baptist traditions or, or Pentecostal traditions or even Seventh-day Adventist uh, traditions, um, there really is an emphasis on the personal relationship with Jesus. That's sort of the first thing. Uh, and a, a commitment uh, to professing belief in in the scriptures. Uh, that's another core element. Um, and those things are present um, in, in our vows. But then it, it, it gets into a little bit more of one's own personal conduct. Um, and uh, each uh, sort of tradition or denomination uh, specifies things that are different, uh, different personal expressions. But there's a real focus um, on the personal relationship, nurturing that personal relationship with Christ. Um, and there's a slight emphasis on, or, or mention at least, of growing uh, and contributing to the life and work of a congregation. Um, but the emphasis um, in some of these other traditions that focus on a believer baptism uh, is uh, one, a, a person's uh, relationship with Jesus. Whereas in the uh, Presbyterian tradition or Reformed tradition, uh, there's the, the emphasis on teaching that person to grow in their relationship with Christ, um, and that this teaching and encouragement and nurturing happens within the context of an entire community, people working together uh, to, to do that. Uh, and so it's really kind of the difference between more of an individual mentality uh, in term and comparing that to a community mentality. And there's a real commitment in our vows to becoming a mature Christian, to maturing in one's faith. Uh, and this maturity is a lifelong quest. It's not um, tied to one's physical maturity. You think, well, you get to be 18 years old or 19 years old and you stop growing physically um, and uh, and mentally. But no, uh, you 
you continue to grow your whole life long. And uh, I'm so encouraged uh, that within our congregation at St. John's, uh, I see uh, people as, as young as, as four years old uh, and uh, you know, even, even 10, 11, 12 into their teens, uh, adults all the way up to uh, people in their 90s continuing that quest for spiritual maturity. Not to say that they're spiritually immature, but to say that uh, there's a commitment uh, to, to growth in their faith and deeper knowledge of who God is um, and a deeper trust in the presence of Christ uh, and a, a more open willingness to lean into the Holy Spirit. Um, and so uh, why is baptism part of the Great Commission? The, the key concept at the heart of this baptism is that ongoing commitment. Uh, and so for, for some uh, that would see, for example, infant baptism as uh, sort of that's the ticket in, into uh, the party that is eternal life, uh, that's, a, that's a very misguided view. Uh, of that um, and and not really uh, rooted in a willingness to be committed to Christ right now. Um, but infant baptism today, it's like saying, the parents saying, you know what, we're going to invest in a ticket uh, that, uh, that we will take our child along with this congregation uh, on an expedition as we go and explore um, who Christ is as our guide uh, and uh, and discover the landscape that is before us uh, that God has created and that uh, that the Spirit inspires us uh, to to contribute to, and so it's a journey. It's a community journey uh, that we do together, and, and baptism is one of those ways that we um, we commit to doing that. Uh, and so uh, again, at the heart of this, it's it's commitment, and it's a commitment to growth. Um, in Christ and a willingness to, to become mature in our faith, uh, but also uh, a, a willingness um, to, to not just be contented that we ourselves have been baptized, but to do our part to contribute um, to uh, having others be baptized as well. And, uh, and encouraging others to make that commitment to Jesus, to make that commitment to faith. As a, I was at a, a conference this week, and uh, uh, as a, a friend of uh, mine, and someone that we've heard musically uh, here the last uh, couple of years, uh, Reverend Glenn Soderholm, uh, uh, Presbyterian minister in Guelph, uh, phrased it this way, and I think it's, I would say it sort of sums up my experience of Presbyterians and the, the various congregations I've been a part of, is that Presbyterians we can talk about God until the cows come home. We're, we're quite, you know, comfortable with that. But when you get into uh, a personal relationship with Jesus and being able to, to talk about what that means or what that looks like or what that feels like or how you want to express that in, your, in, in one's own life, there, there gets to be a little bit more maybe discomfort there. And that, well, maybe that's more for those uh, evangelistic folks to talk about their personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, but I believe that, um, you know, it's important to have a, an, a great knowledge about God and a belief in him. But we also need to nurture that, that interactive relationship with Jesus. And, uh, and, and as we do that, nurture that. Um, then we're, we're able to, to grow more mature as Christians. Uh, and so as our, I think our challenge as Presbyterians, not just as people at St. John's, I'm not, I'm not picking on us, uh, but I am saying that uh, it's important for us to be able to lean into that uh, kind of language and kind of understanding of who Jesus is and how he is present with us. Um, and then we get to the Holy Spirit, and at that point, uh, Presbyterians kind of maybe feel like that's a little bit maybe too mystic for us, a little bit too mystical, uh, a little bit too mysterious. But the truth is, friends, that when we um, are, are really called into that personal relationship with Christ, uh, th that great mystery that God has created for us to discover and discern uh, by having a, a relationship with Christ, uh, that's guided by the Spirit. And, um, 
and certainly when we follow the Spirit's leading, maybe that's a, a tug at our heart or a thought that, that won't leave us alone or a, a conversation we have with somebody and, and this light bulb of clarity goes off in our minds and our understanding. We know that that's, that's the Spirit prompting us to do something, to, uh, to respond. Back to our scripture uh, in John chapter 3, uh, this is really um, sort of the first time that Jesus talks about uh, about the, the Father and Himself and and the Spirit being born of water and the Spirit, um, and knowing that uh, that God the Father has sent Him, uh, and then we get into uh, near the end of that passage in verse verse fifteen when Jesus says the Son of Man will be lifted up, and that's a foreshadowing of of His death on the cross, and then Jesus uh, concludes. Um, with those two verses that we talked about at the beginning, um, that to whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life uh, because he, uh, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Uh, and again, back to the Greek, that uh, word save uh, is, you know, can also be trans translated as the word rescue. Uh, and so, uh, so what does that mean for us as, uh, as people at St. John's through the way that we, we treat them, through the way that we speak to them, the way that we listen to them, the way that we serve them? Um, but it also means having some courageous conversations and asking people about uh, their spiritual journey or uh, praying that maybe those opportunities will come our way. And when they do, that we can be open to discussing that with them. Uh, and to, to listen to where they are, and we can share where we are, being able to articulate that faith. Uh, when I look at uh, at St. John's and kind of where we are in terms of um, fulfilling our, our baptismal vows, I would say that, that we are doing okay. Uh, we need to continue encouraging one another, whether that's encouraging our children or encouraging seniors or, pe or parents or people in between. That's happening, but I think you can never have too much encouragement. And I've seen that at times uh, through our, our parks group, through our um, uh, chair chats, uh, through our life group, um, and, and through even PW starting up again. Um, but it, it goes beyond those, those, those inward looking things and finding ways to look outward that uh, we can connect with people that are new to us and hopefully new to Christ, so that uh, we can work together as a community to uh, to nurture them to the point where they would want to be baptized and publicly affirm their faith, or if they've already been baptized, uh, to come alongside them, uh, to teach them, to learn from them, and to share life together. Amen. Still, my striving sees my comforter.
Let us close our time together with prayer. Let us bow our heads and let us pray. Holy Spirit of the living God, invisible like the wind, we do not see, but you are moving among us. Come into our hearts that we may be renewed and reborn. Open our minds that we may see your mighty work every day. Lift up our eyes to where the cross of Christ stands for our healing. Healing from physical, mental, spiritual illnesses. We know that as the great physician, you are always at work. We pray for all those who need to be touched and receive healing. We pray for the brokenhearted, for relationships that are falling apart. We bring to you divine attention all the caregivers, those who quietly and tirelessly and with love take care of their loved ones day and night at home. We pray for the nurses, doctors, assistants, personal support workers, cleaners who sacrifice so much for the well-being of others. Bless them, Lord, with patience, understanding, wisdom, and faith. We pray for this broken world, especially for your divine intervention to end this pandemic. Lift up our eyes where the cross of Christ stands for our healing, so we may believe and in believing not die, but have eternal life. Through him who in your love for us you sent into the world to change everything. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us go from this time of worship. And although we may not remember the day we were baptized, we remember that we all have been baptized in the name of God the Father, in the name of Christ the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And this triune God continues to uh, be at the heart of who we are and all that we do. Let us continue to uh, 
affirm uh, our baptism uh, and lean into uh, this great commission call to baptize others, to lead them into uh, loving relationships with Christ, that lives may be changed in the kingdom of God, blessed. Go and be filled with the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the peace of Christ, the one who teaches us and who is God's only Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit, who is present with us wherever we are and willing to move us in fruitful ways, in a very powerful way. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.